Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Joe uh, for the invitation uh, to be with you again this year. I enjoyed my stint here last year in relation to the Lisbon Treaty, and we had a very invigorating debate and a good social encounter afterwards. I'm also delighted to be here with a contemporary of mine in UCC, and I'm not being tribal in the African style, as Gary Fitzgerald suggested we might be in this country yesterday, Phil Hogan, um, where I learned from an early age that he was a, a tenacious uh, and effective uh, politician and a great card player um, as, as, as well. Uh, I'm, actually, I'm happy uh, to address the issue of leadership and governance this evening and, of course, to take questions and to participate in the debate afterwards. But calls for a new style of leadership are not only common, they're actually part of the daily business of politics in both good times and bad. There's always a group claiming that everything will be transformed if only there was new leadership. This goes hand in hand with a very traditional and frankly superficial conception of leadership, where a heroic individual achieves great feats by exhortation and winning public support. These are undoubtedly good and important leadership traits, but ultimately this approach ranks performance above the substance of policy action. It reduces leadership to the mastering of presentation and contemporary perceptions. It also has little or no relevance to the core challenges facing our country at this moment. The leadership we need is leadership which is willing to take the right actions to get us through an unprecedented economic crisis, even if they carry a heavy political cost. If we want to have a real debate about leadership and governance in Ireland, then let's link it to the very definite tasks in hand. Let's take a fuller perspective and look across our political culture most of all, let's not forget a basic fact. Leadership isn't measured in opinion polls. Popularity is. Leadership is recognized over time and through people looking at the impact of actions, not their popularity. While there can be an almost obsession in Ireland with reinterpreting and arguing about past events, much of which, which serves no constructive purpose, I do agree that we need to look back over the last decade for key lessons to be learned. Unfortunately, most political commentary on this topic suffers from taking a very narrow focus and generally ignores the context in which decisions were made. If we genuinely want to learn about the failures of public policy, we need an honest appraisal of the past, not a partial or partisan one. We also need to acknowledge the many clear and sustained successes of strategic leadership. A decade-long determination was at the core of the successful implementation of a new set of relations between communities on this island. The scale of infrastructural development has provided an essential foundation for our future. And equally far-seeing investments, such as the creation of a new research community and a transformation of the research landscape, are already having an impact, being central to the presence and success of the part of the economy which is still uh, the most dynamic in terms of the foreign and multinational and research-based sector of the economy. When I was Minister of Education back in 97, the budget for research was nil. Uh, we have transformed research investment and we've created a critical mass uh, of research-based people, which is important in terms of where we want the economy to go into the future. Now, a wide range of reports and studies, including those published recently by the Governor of the Central Bank and international experts, have pointed to three major fiscal and financial issues on top of the international situation, and indeed the impact of joining the euro, has been the reasons why Ireland's recession is as deep as it is. Firstly, spending on public services was increased too much, while taxes became too low and too narrow. Secondly, construction became too significant a part of economic activity. Thirdly, and this is obviously related, banking regulation was not sufficiently restrictive. I accept this analysis and the need to learn lessons from it. On each of these issues, it's only fair to say that there were some voicing warnings, which are both detailed and utterly unconnected to the writings of those who refused to acknowledge any progress. Why did these warnings not have an impact? Firstly, the bulk of the analysis at the time combined some warnings on details with generally positive projections. The OECD, for example, in early 2007, reviewed the economy and said it was robust while concluding a detailed analysis of the housing market with the summary 
that there was a relatively small overvaluation which would most likely be corrected gently and over the medium term. It is an uncontroversial fact that every single budget and commitment was made in line with consensus projections for the economy. Unlike in other countries, there was no political manipulation of projections. Secondly, the thrust of public debate was, to was towards increasing these errors, not restraining them. It is impossible to look back through this period and miss the dominance of demands for even more spending, reduced taxes, lower house prices, and easier regulation. And I think the debate on regulation is particularly important because the last decade, it was an era of anti-regulation. The whole demand was, will you reduce regulation more in all sectors? And in fact, there was a consensus in the Doyle that we should try and achieve an EU benchmark of a 25% reduction uh, in regulation because it was perceived to be stimulating business, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That was the culture, that was the debate, that's the context within people were having discussions um, and so on. As for Leinster House, you can search the record and you will find isolated sentences and sometimes even whole paragraphs which went against this trend. But the overwhelming thrust of debate, motions, questions, amendments and even interruptions involved demands for more of the same. One particular spokesman specialised in starting economic speeches with a demand for spending restraint which he quickly followed with a lengthy denunciation of the failure to increase various spending programs. To give a fuller picture, in the period from mid-97 to mid-2008, there were 304 motions during private members' business. And this was a weekly period of three hours where the opposition parties and independents got to control the topic before the Doyle. As government is always accused of keeping the most important issues off the agenda, this is seen as the opposition's time to rectify the situation. In these 304 motions, there were many demands for major extra spending and condemnations of the failure to provide it. There was not even one single call for aggressive bank regulation, reduced construction activity, or higher and broader taxes. There was felt to be a need to debate a motion on greyhound doping, for example, but none for what could be described as a credible alternative economic strategy. The growth our country saw throughout that period was, it's fair to say, of a scale that no one predicted or had experienced. In the international economy, it was also a time of sustained growth and optimism combined with weaker regulation in the international economy. There can be no doubt that our broad political system simply was not engaged in seeking out systemic economic risks. There was a collective failure to examine, to debate, and to act outside of a comfort zone reinforced by consensus estimates and public expectations. And that was not just um, in Leinster House. I can recall as Minister for Health addressing the INO, the Irish Nurses Organization, a packed gathering of maybe 500 or 600 nurses. I was with Liz McManus of the Labour Party and I think Olivia Mitchell of, um, of the Fine Gael Party and the economist Jim Power, who outdid all three politicians because most economists attacked benchmarking as did Jim, but in front of 500 nurses, Jim declared that benchmarking was a disgrace because it only gave nurses 8%. He duly got a standing ovation uh, in the presence of red-faced politicians who didn't even go that far. That's the kind of context in which people were operating in, and I think it's important to remind people of the kind of debate that was going on. What our country most needs, so you can, you can follow a narrow blame game if you want, but all this achieves is to once again miss the challenges which a more comprehensive examination of the last decade poses for all of us. It's lazy and it's self-serving. If large parts of our public sphere insist that they've always been right, then nothing will change. If you miss these lessons, then you end up with politics as usual, which is the last thing our country needs. What our country most needs now in terms of political leadership is a single-minded commitment to the actions central to securing our economic future. The actions required are absolutely clear. A sustained major reduction in the fiscal deficit, the reconstruction of the financial system, and strategic investment and development of an enterprise economy. There is no time to be wasted, and quite frankly, there is no alternative. Almost everyone is now in favour of reducing the deficit in line with our commitments to the European Union. This involves significant annual cuts in expenditure. Given the fact that the bulk of public spending goes on paying social supports and providing frontline services, there is no painless way of reducing spending. It is in the journey from the general commitment to taking specific action that you see the leadership we need. 
And it is also here that you see a widening political gulf. On the one hand, you have a credible and detailed plan which is being implemented. On the other, you have a continued obsession with tactical maneuvering, even if it is at the cost of undermining a supposedly principled commitment to reducing the deficit. In the case of Labour, the Labour Party, for example, it produced a pre-budget package which fell apart in days and is now pushing an agenda of attacking every specific cut. When it came to the vital issue of reducing the cost of the public service, an obsession with not being on the wrong side of uncertain public opinion led the party's leadership to take the brave position of having no opinion on the Crow Park deal. Fine Gael has been willing to support some tough measures, but is now at sea, I suggest, in relation to the overall strategy. It gave an absolute commitment to meeting the agreed targets, then called for one billion less in cuts next year, and finally proposed extra bond borrowing in the region of four billion to fund its new era policy. In terms of the financial system, there remains a lot of debate, and a lot to debate. And there have been and will remain few decisions which come with anything close to certainty as to their action. As has been said in recent days, you can cherry pick quotes in a complex exchange to suit a predetermined interp interpretation, or you can engage in an, in an honest debate. Tactical maneuvering may make good politics out of now condemning a decision you voted for, but this has nothing to do with showing leadership. The same can be said of the tactic of opposing everything while proposing nothing. The political leadership our country needs is one which refuses to participate in the permanent campaign dominating so much of the news cycle, where actions are discussed in terms of popularity and political maneuvering. We need leadership which is willing to push ahead with the right decisions, even if they are the toughest decisions politically. We don't need pandering or the pretense that general statements are as important as specific actions. As I've said, I believe we look at leadership in too narrow and traditional a way, and that this serves us particularly badly at this moment in time. I think exactly the same could be said about how we view the issue of governance, by which I mean the way we go about implementing and overseeing public action. To have effective governance, you have to have a dialogue which is balanced and comprehensive, not one which is mostly partisan and tendentious. If every discussion and every report is solely examined for points to be scored, the harder and more important business of real oversight is being missed. I experienced a particularly ridiculous example of this dysfunctional approach to debating serious public policy in my time as a Minister for Education. On the morning I launched what was a detailed and evidence-based initiative on technology and research, I was immediately attacked by my opposite number for spending the money on, a, on this area when there was more important priorities. The initiative received a positive public response, and by the time the Doyle debated implementing legislation, I was being attacked for spending too little on this area. There are many things we could do in the Oireachtas to improve the quality of debate and oversight. I would be in favour of significantly expanding the independent research facility in the Oireachtas, somewhat in line with the Congressional Budget Office in the United States or the facility in the House of Commons. With this, we would have more detailed oversight of government and be able to enforce a principle that we have honest debates between detailed alternatives. The absence of costed alternatives distorts debate and gives the public no access to making its own evaluation of proposals. To give one example, a compulsory private health insurance model of funding health services is something I disagree with, but it is credible to propose it. What is absurd is that it will shortly be 10 years since Labour first proposed it and committed to producing detailed implementation plans and costings. Neither of these have appeared, even though in the last manifesto implementation was promised almost immediately. It's a very fundamental policy uh, proposition, but to be fair, it hasn't had any detailed costings um, or, or, or plans uh, appended to it. Every private member's bill should be independently costed so that people can see the cost of proposals rather than just hear hours of exploitative empathy. Equally, every parliamentary group should be assisted to produce an alternative full book of estimates so that they can present their alternatives at the detailed level where the real choices are made. As a minister, I would welcome the opportunity to have a more comprehensive and constructive oversight of my work through committee meetings, which have involved a real debate about alternatives to my proposals. And to be fair, in the context of the Foreign Affairs Committee in Dial Airden and the European Affairs Committee, I get far, I, I've had far more detailed engagement with committee members than I ever had as a health minister, education minister, uh, or enterprise uh, minister. The need to move to a new approach to regulation is obvious, and we now know from the past that too restrictive regulation can be destructive and that too restrained regulation can equally be destructive. 
We have to work hard in implementing a new balance, which in, system, which in systemically important areas like banking will have to err on the side of being restrictive. As a relatively small country, and having only recently introduced regulation into many areas, there will always be a relatively limited pool of expertise to draw on, and proposals to create a critical mass and more active oversight should be proceeded with. If you look back on the political debates on both financial and general regulation, the bulk of comment actually related to consumer affairs. This is, of course, a vital issue, but the political system did not show itself to be capable of ongoing engagement with more technical and abstract areas. The provision of more expert staff for the Oireachtas may be an option, and certainly it should be considered when industries are being levied to fund their regulation. The public service is central to governance. In the bulk of public service areas, no system in the world has shown a viable model of delivering them other than through a permanent public service. If we want people to teach, to nurse, police, or administer, then we need public servants and their wages and pensions will always be a major element in public expenditure. Over the last two years, this has meant, because of that reality, that they have received a significant cut in their income, and, that numbers, and their numbers have also fallen. I strongly reject the idea put forward by some who present our public servants as a problem to be addressed. I have seen countless examples of dedicated and effective service which stands proudly against best international standards. We do not have a pampered and beloved public service. Yes, our duty to the public means we have to always look for reforms and to seek out problems, but I believe the quality of our public service will in general play a central and positive part in securing our future. The Crow Park deal is a move forward. In terms of enhancing the public service's role in effective governance, there are also initiatives we should consider. A lot of innovations introduced in Britain, such as departmental non-executive directors, have yet to be proven, while some others actively caution against the idea that you can mirror private sector management structures in the public service. This said, a greater career flexibility is probably the only way of making sure that the technical expertise required to oversee many areas is available within the service. I also think there is a role to be played by experts who are not part of the permanent service, but can work within it on a medium-term basis. Finally, in relation to governance, increased public engagement is essential. If we are to have an effective political system, then it must have popular legitimacy. Only when the public is given the information to move beyond whatever the fight of the day is or the partial presentation of complex issues will they be able to hold the system to account. This is something that nearly every developed society is struggling with, but there are obvious things we could do. In particular, in light of the amount of public information which is distributed on an ongoing basis. At the end of every budgetary process, we should consider giving to every voter each year a report on what the Oireachtas has decided to do in terms of tax and spending. In certain parts of the United States, this is a relatively common and has proved, po and has proved possible and has proved possible to, prevent, to present such information in an easily understood uh, yet objective way. Obviously, an independent entity uh, within the Oireachtas would be in charge uh, of this process. One of the lessons which people have missed from Robert Putnam's bowling alone is that periods of low social engagement have generally been quickly followed by dramatic increases. In terms of politics, much of the same evidence is available. There is no doubt that we are in a period of significant political change. The big biggest mistake you could make in looking at this is to assume that the dynamics we see today will be the same in two years' time or even next year. The Labour staffer who told the local newspaper last week that Labour and Fine Gael would have over 70% of the seats in the next stall was perhaps being a bit presumptuous, maybe even arrogant, but there you are. But I think it, it also betrayed a commitment to constant electioneering, which has obvious short-term benefits, but leaves open the likelihood that voter volatility will be as significant in the next two years as it has been in the last two. The next election should be fought from when it is called and I believe it will ultimately be shaped by people's views of the political responses from mid-2008. When our country gets through this crisis, and it will, people will assess many things. Part of it will definitely be policy in the decade before 2008, but it will fundamentally include a much broader assessment. The speeches about how everything has been lost and Ireland is back to where it began have no doubt already been written, but they will suffer from the problem of not being true. Versus the pre-boom period, Ireland will still be in a position 
of having higher standards of living, lower consistent poverty, higher pensions, smaller classes, more hospital treatment with better survival rates, longer life expectancy, which is the fundamental objective uh, of good health care, and that has been a feature of the last number of years, internationally peer-reviewed in terms of longer life expectancy, more guardian to beat, more education places. It's interesting in terms of the EU context, the 2020 strategy has two big targets in education. Uh, one, I think, over 40%, uh, or, sorry, one is 40% participation in third level, and the other um, is um, to achieve a 10%, to get to 90% completion rate at second level. Ireland, before we even start this five-year program, has already exceeded both benchmarks. Um, so, you know, it, it, there has been progress in a number of areas, and we should not lose sight um, of that. There's better uh, infrastructure, and there are many, many more examples of progress that has occurred. Between now and then, however, our country needs and our people deserves leadership, which is willing to put doing the right thing above short, narrow uh, electoral uh, concerns. Thank you very much indeed.